Stories are a critical part of the work that we do at AIJCast, and that connects us very strongly to the work of the church. At the heart of what we believe is story, it's the story of God's love for God's people. It's the story of God's love for all people, as expressed most powerfully in Jesus Christ, whose primary mode of teaching was story. It was the parable and even stories that people didn't understand, and even the disciples scratched their heads at. So story is this mystical, mysterious, connecting thing that lies at the heart of what we do. For AIJCast, it has become, in a way, our trademark because what we do is we invite artists into a storytelling space. I invite them to tell the story of how they got interested in their particular form of art, to tell stories about the pieces of art, to dig deeply into why that art matters and connects with what's happening in the world. And then me bringing my own story into that conversation such that it becomes a podcast, but it also becomes kind of a long form dialogue sermon, a way of exploring faith and things of meaning and purpose that are connecting to what is happening in that eternal story, but also in this momentary story in which we are living. I think one of the most fascinating things that I have discovered is the more personal the story that an artist tells, specifically through their art, the more personal it is, the more powerfully it resonates with other people, especially people who have not experienced the kind of thing that they are sharing. So I think about a songwriter that I talked to who wrote a song about a very, very powerful breakup with a toxic personality and wrote this gorgeous song. And that song resonates with people strongly who have had that experience and who haven't had that experience because the power of that experience translates through the art itself and draws people in. And so I think we lean into the very specific nature of our stories while we also recognize the power for them to connect around the world. I think that's the message of Jesus, right? That Jesus came to a particular place at a particular time and spoke in parables as a way of speaking to those particular people. And yet that story still continues to resonate with people who never lived in Palestine, who were never shepherds, who never fished for a living, who have never experienced poverty, while it also continues to resonate with all of those folks as well. The more we dig into the particular notions of our own story, the more it has the possibility to spread and connect with those that we might not connect with otherwise. The work of a new worshiping community, the work of the church, and the work specifically of a new worshiping community has to be deeply contextual to a very specific place at a very specific time. When I talk about AIJ cast and the people that we talk to, we are building this community in 2020. We are building this community at a time when we are dealing with urgent, important protests to defend black lives. All of these things are part of the context in the world into which we speak. And we are doing it through the lens of art and the way that artists bring this kind of prophetic sense to community. Artists, particularly artists that are deeply rooted in that sacredness, are the prophets because they can hold a mirror up to the things that we don't want to see, to the ugliness that we want to ignore, and they can also paint a picture of what beauty, God's beauty, of what the kingdom might look like. They have an imagination that we can tap into. One of the places that I really resonate with this is with a Palestinian scholar, Christian theologian named Mitri Raheb, who talks about his vision for creating Palestinian contextual Christianity. He talks about wanting to create a community that is rooted in Arab cultural norms of musicality, of architecture, of liturgy, that really helps to resonate and to remind us that that's where Jesus came from in the first place, right? That deeply resonates with the people who are part of that community and doesn't just stay there, but moves out around the world and connects with others in ways that resonate. I think that's true of every new worshiping community. It is deeply contextual. It begins with a specific call with a specific group of people. Those people may be diverse in terms of representation, they may be narrow, but they are a specific context. And so rooting in oneself in that context is how that story begins. It tells the story of these folk and how they are the image of God, how they bear the image of God, how they are the body of Christ, and how what they bring to the world is a gift to the world that needs to be nurtured and supported and loved and listened to 
and celebrated. Storytelling when it comes to proclaiming the gospel is critical. Our Lord and Savior was an amazing storyteller. You don't get any cooler than a parable, okay? We're still scratching our heads like, what did he say? What's that? What? I want to know more about that. But it connects people. Stained glass is storytelling. Little videos are storytelling. Your PowerPoint is storytelling. But the truth of the matter is your passion and heart for what God is doing in you, in this community, what's bubbling up, that is what captures people's hearts. They want to know that there is more to life than going to work, coming home, paying bills, owing people stuff, things that don't fill them. They are so hungry. Tell me a story that helps me to know that there's a God who loves all of us and that there is some kind of difference or change happening in the world. Um, I think for me, when I talked about the commonplace, I think the most compelling part is that you have two churches, a rich white one in the suburbs and a poor black church in the heart of the, of the community that often was overlooked. And this unlikely collaboration that God says, I'm going to do a new thing that changes both communities. I had one of my leaders who did a photography class uh, for about a year, engineer, you know, all kinds of cool stuff in tears because he had, he had to move away. But he said, Aisha, what I've done in this year has literally like changed my life. Like it's literally changed my life. Like I wouldn't be like a whole person had I not done this or watching all kinds of you know, kids connect right now. There's a, a program at the Common Place where kids are learning how to code. Little kids in the hood coding. How cool is that? So really, it's stories of transformation. So practice storytelling. Tell stories around the table. Tell them to your family. Turn on your phone and tell somebody who might be listening that God is doing transformative things. You are the story. So don't let somebody else tell it. You have to learn how to tell it. Stories is really the way the gospel is presented. It's, it's the way in which we learn about who God is. It's the way in which God speaks to us. And I think the reason why stories are the primary vehicle by which God communicates to us is because it's powerful. So whether you're watching it on your phone, looking at Instagram stories, or looking at YouTube stories, it's stories are everywhere. The stories are powerful. It's one of the best ways in which we can communicate to one another. I think there are three reasons, at least in my opinion, as to why stories are so powerful. One, they paint an amazing picture. When you hear a great story, you can envision it, you can see it. Even though you weren't there, you could vicariously experience it because you're able to see what's happening. You are able to participate in what took place. And likewise, that is a close second to that is that when there's an amazing picture that's painted, it evokes incredible emotion on the listener or the hearer or the reader and you are emotionally connected with that story. And lastly, stories promote meaning. One of the things that my mom would do when I was young would always read stories to me, in particular Aesop's fables. Mm -hmm. And I would really enjoy listening to these stories because not only did they paint a picture, not only did it evoke my emotion, but what it really did was it promoted meaning to me. I understood what the story was getting at. I still remember there was a story about a dog who had a bone in his mouth and he went over a bridge. And when he went over a bridge, he saw another dog with a bone in his mouth. So he wanted that bone as well. So it barked, trying to get the other dog to let it go. And what he realized quickly was that he was actually looking at a reflection of himself. And then so barking, he dropped his bone and actually lost everything. And that story really, to me, promoted a meaning of what greed looks like when you're not content. Stories are incredibly powerful because they paint pictures, they really connect with their emotions, and they promote a meaning. So we tell stories all the time to connect, to persuade, to explain, to inspire. They create sticky memories by attaching emotions to the things that happened. And this means that leaders who can create and share good stories, they have a powerful advantage over others. They have powerful leadership. And fortunately, everyone has the ability to become a better storyteller. There are workshops, TED Talks, coaches, storytelling training, and it is often worth it. And sidebar, if you're part of a people who have had others tell the stories about you, this is particularly important. Some of us are specifically called to tell stories that challenge dominant narratives. 
that intervene and circumvent and that reflect different values, that reflect a future that we envision, that uplift their own stories of justice and liberation that are needed. And we'd like to recommend the Center for Story-Based Strategy. They're multilingual. You can get on their website. What it tells you there is that they're a national movement building organization dedicated to harnessing the power of story for social change. And they do trainings and all sorts of things. Some are online workshops that are self-paced. Others are live trainings. But they're all designed to help us think about how we tell our stories such that we use story to bring about change. We want to share with you a great story. It's the story of Sirius Juju. And they have compelling stories. Their pastor tells them. Plenty of other people tell them. And while this is a professionally created video by the 1001 people, we think you'll enjoy their story. But a little background first. Sirius Juju is a skateboarding ministry. It's a new worshiping community in Kalispell, Montana. Reverend Miriam Moritzen is their pastor. And they actually formed when a few people in Kalispell started noticing the skateboarders in the parking lot at the tiny little skateboard park and everywhere else that didn't seem to have adults come and show up for them. At dinner time, at a time when maybe on a school night they would better be home, at a time when snow was falling and the kids would still be out. Rather than labeling these children as problems, they said, Let's show up for them. And they brought water bottles and they brought food. And eventually the people who started Sirius Juju opened their garage for a safer place to skate in the cooler months, which in Montana is about eight months out of the year. Sirius Juju got its name because its founder said, you know, there's good Juju, there's bad Juju, but in Jesus you find Sirius Juju. Enjoy their story. The dark is very scary for these kids. Kids in poverty in this town that go to bed hungry at night, that's when the police come or CPS. They go to school the next day and they're tired because they haven't had to sleep because they've been on watch for whatever danger. There's some deep roots here that doesn't understand what these kids are going through this day and age. You know, they get picked on at school and just basically everywhere for being a skateboarder. You know, skateboarding is a good thing for these kids. And what Juju has done is absolutely amazing. So Serious Juju is an indoor skate park. We're a food ministry or a shelter from the storms and crisis of kids are having. Serious Juju is a new church. Uh, we minister to kids uh, and all who love them. Nobody wants them. And Juju is a place that they can go and be safe and be wanted and be cared for. I used to be a prosecutor. I used to prosecute skateboarders. I used to think they were little, uh, little terrorists that were vandals. And so for me, it, that was a big change to accept these, these people as uh, God's chosen children. These are kids that um, some of them have drug addictions, some alcohol, uh, some find themselves in homes where their parents are addicts. I really believe Juju, is, it's a matter of life and death. For our kids, they're living on that knife edge and they can fall towards life or they can fall towards death. And if Juju weren't there, who knows? Well, at home it wasn't going too well because like my dad would like drink a lot and like get aggressive around me. And he said, if he hits me again, can I run? I said, yeah, you can run and go show somebody if there's a mark. But it broke my heart to send him back to hell that night. And preparing a child to return to hell, you're never ready for that. That's just like torture. Like you get hit in the mouth and then you have to go to school for half the day and, and then go home. I met these wonderful people, Jen and Dan, and they uh, uh, said, we'll take him. I heard how the people of this group uh, stood behind Vlad. Something in the stories that we heard, the words that we heard, was enough to touch our heart and make us see that there was something bigger. It, it's profound for the skaters when they hear there's a community out there that loves you 
and that is given to make this skate park possible. Uh, it's the people who in my church who have come to serve them. The uh, people who cook food and bring food, the men who have worked on the ramps. And when they hear that the community has been so generous to want to give a skate park for them, then, then they'll, from that moment, let you pray. <laughs> the grant that we received has kept this ministry alive and you are experiencing the fruits of the Presbyterian Church USA right here. And, and part of what we believe, you know, with that cross, you can put all your pain and your brokenness and it can transform into healing for others. And so when I see these kids pour out their hearts and what's really going on in their lives and they become sources of healing for others, that's living into the gospel. But they give me life. I never doubt that this, that this matters. I'm not crying. You're depressed. Uh, you're the one crying. I'm not crying. You might be crying. <laughs> I'm not crying. Serious Juju makes me cry. But what a powerful story. What a great, great story of what they're doing. And as we mentioned earlier, it just really connected with their heart and emotion. So what made the story so great? Well, we want to share with you some elements that we think are critical, essential to have a great story. Mm -hmm. And the first is, it's like a great sermon. You have to be really clear on who the audience is and what the message you want to share is. So you start with the message. That's number one. Every storytelling moment should start, every formal storytelling moment should start by asking, who is my audience and what's the message I want to share with them? And since we're talking about storytelling in this moment where we're talking about practices that lead to new worshiping community thriving, we're talking about the storytelling of your community. So start with asking who your audience is and what you want them to know. It's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Not only is it about your new worshiping community, but it's really your story. We want to encourage you to mind your own experiences. Don't try to tell someone else's story. Don't try to tell somebody else's experience, but a powerful story is one where you are the storyteller. You are telling your life experience. You're telling your memories. You're telling your message in a way that makes it so compelling. And so we want you to really talk about what you're doing, about what your ministry is doing, about what your new worship community is doing. The best storytellers look to their own memories and life experiences as an illustration of their message. Third, don't make yourself the hero of the story. You can be a central figure, but the ultimate focus should be on the community, on the people you know, on the lessons you've learned, on the events you have witnessed. And whenever possible, you should work hard to make this person or that person the hero. Fourth, we want to encourage you to highlight a struggle. I think whenever you watch any compelling story, whether, again, it's on TV or a movie, there's always some challenge, some problem that has to be overcome, right? So each and every one of you, you are starting a new worshiping community because you saw a problem. You saw a struggle that you wanted to solve. So I think what would be incredibly compelling is for you to share that story, that problem that you're trying to solve and how you're solving it to those around you. As disappointing as it may be, not every story you tell has to be a surprising edge of your seat epic. Some of the most successful and memorable stories are relatively simple, straightforward. So don't let needless detail distract from your core message. Keep it simple. And finally, though there may be more for our time here, practice makes perfect. Storytelling is an art. And just like any other art form, the more you practice, the more you do, the better it's going to get. Practice with your friends, your loved ones, trusted colleagues, and hone that message. Say, share that story over and over and over again, because the more you share that story, the easier it's going to be to share that story. And not only will it be easier, the more compelling, the more impactful that story will be 
So don't be afraid to share that story. It doesn't have to be perfect when you first start off, but just keep on telling. Tell it to anyone that will listen. Because the more you tell that story, the more compelling of a storyteller you will become. Mm 